my bottom line in my book, as I said before, is if if you don't fit in, choose to stand out. And it's a choice. Welcome to Onward Live, a live stream focused on encouraging you to create a life you love living now. Let's go beyond success to significance. Being clear on our why is crucial. It requires doing the inner work, finding ourselves, getting to know ourselves, embracing our inner child, shedding social conditioning, and letting go of perfect. We know obstacles make us stronger. We can dream big and take action. Believe you can, and you're halfway there. I invite you to tune in every week and engage with me and my inspiring guests. Invite your friends. Let's make time for what matters most in our lives. Let's move onward together. Hi, everybody who's watching live. And for those of you who are listening later when this is published as a podcast, I appreciate you guys. Welcome. I'm excited to introduce my guest. She's a friend of mine, Captain Barb Bell, and we've known each other for a while. And we have a lot in common. And we're looking forward to this discussion as well. So let me introduce Barb. Um, Flying has helped Barbara Bell view the world differently. As one of the first women to graduate from the United States Naval Academy and the United States Naval Test Pilot School, her perspective from up above has prepared her to empower the next generation of female leaders. And she does that by, you know, lots of different ways, but one of the ways, and we'll talk about a lot of them tonight on the show, but one of the ways is in 1992, she and her fellow fellow aviators went to Capitol Hill to help successfully repeal the combat exclusion laws, opening up combat aircraft and ships to women in the services. So, you know, I graduated in 1985, Barb graduated in 1983. When I graduated, there was only like two different kinds of ships I could go on. I think it was a destroyer tender and a submarine tender. We didn't have very many options. And it's because of people like Barb that women today have many more options from which to choose. So let me bring Barb in. Welcome. Hi, Emily. I am so excited to be here tonight. You know, Thank you. Friend from a long, uh, for many years. We've yes. walked a lot of similar paths. Yes. Yeah. So Barb, welcome. And Thank I'm you. excited to talk about your book, which I have here, you know, and my Excellent. dad has, my mom and dad, after they read it, they're like, oh my gosh, she's amazing. She's amazing. She, I felt like saying, well, what about me? You know, she, <laughs> she's amazing. She's amazing. My dad even emailed you, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah. He did. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, you know, it's really a story. It's, you know, it's, it's my story, but it's, uh, it's a greater story, of course. You know, it's about the, you know, the work that we did, uh, you know, at the Naval Academy in those early years. Mm -hmm. you know, where the law said we could be there and much of our experience was, was telling us differently, but we persisted, you know, we picked up we did. one foot and put it in front of the other and then it did it again and again. And it, you know, it made all the difference, made all the difference in our own lives. You know, the Naval Academy changes all of us. There is just no doubt about that. And it's allowed me to connect with amazing, you know, amazing women who've been through that similar journey. You know, yeah. I, I saw you years ago. It's like, hey, I get you. You know, you get me. It's it's mm -hmm. it's wonderful. Yeah, we this we have this amazing sisterhood now. Yeah, no, we do. Mm -hmm. Well, why did you decide to tell your story and write a book? I mean, it's one thing to do everything you've done, but then to sit down and write it and put it in a book that t that's a lot of work. You know, it's it's so funny. I've been telling my story for years, speaking in front of live audiences, what you know, from kindergarten on up through you know executives. And it was, I think it was, it was in 20, it was in 2017, I was finishing my doctorate at Vanderbilt and I was interviewing a gentleman down in Orlando, Florida for, on a totally different subject. And he stopped me mid interview and he said, you need to write your book and I'm going to give you the name of the woman who's going to help you do that. And her name was Wendy Kurtz. And it felt like a bolt of lightning that came out of the sky. And I thought, okay, all right, God, I get it. It is time. I've been told that many, I've told that myself, to myself over the years, and other people have said, you really need to write this down. So I did. Yeah. I did. Wendy, that's interesting, because she messed, she, you know, she was emailing me, because she was on the meeting notice for the show, right? So she was emailing me, and then her husband is from Stanton, which is where I live. Oh, my gosh. So, 
small it's a world. Very, it's a very small world. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. To, you know, it's important that we, one, that we all tell our stories because we empower others by doing that. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and two, it was just, it was critical that, you know, I could feel it from inside me that I needed to do this. And I've been really, really surprised with how well it's been received. You know, yeah. you, you take a risk to, to tell your story. Absolutely. And my, my male classmates, business leaders are really enjoying it. They're saying, hey, Good. this is a story that needs to be told. That's nice. <laughs> it's nice to be supported by your classmates. Yes, and very, very yeah. much so. so. Yeah. So that's how, that's how I, I did it. It was like, okay, you need to write this down and I'm going to give you the name of the woman who's going to help you do that. So I appreciate Wendy Kurtz at Elizabeth Charles and Associates. Mm-hmm. And she guided me through this process. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So, so you've got a bachelor's degree in systems engineering and then a master's degree in aeronautical engineering and a, another master's in theology and a doctorate in education from Vanderbilt. How do you have time to do all of that? (laughs) Well, I retired a number of years ago from the Navy and I took time to unwind. I had had this highly technical career and particularly as a program manager, a high stress environment. I wanted more time with my children. So I retired and I I did some consulting work and then I just felt this itch, I, I need to do something different. And so that something different was actually to explore theology. So I joined, you know, I went to Merrill Hurst University. I thought, I'll, I'll give this a try. You know, this is something, this is something totally different. So I'll do that. And while I was studying theology at Merrill Hurst, had a massive life change. My husband didn't want to be married anymore, but that place kind of caught me. And I, and what I discovered, you know, sometimes, you know, s- trying something different, will help you discover aspects about yourself that you've either forgotten Mm -hmm. or have always been there and need to be amplified. I I rediscovered my love of writing. I rediscovered my love of education and that actually spurred me on to go to Vanderbilt University and pursue a doctorate in education so I could help develop the next generation of leaders. It's interesting. We, We both chose paths that are not the typical path that somebody chooses when they retire from the military or even from the federal government like I did. I mean, Mm -hmm. you were a consultant for a little bit, but then you kind of stopped that, right? I did some consulting for a little bit, but then I'm like, I'm going to be a coach. And I, I spent some time becoming a coach, getting to be a certified coach and all that. And then now I'm kind of back in the federal contracting arena a little bit because I'm representing positive intelligence, the one of the coaching programs that I love and helping them get back into the federal government. And you're back into kind of science, uh, the STEM area, right? And helping girls, right? Get into STEM. yeah, Yeah, I'm a huge advocate for, for girls and women in STEM. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's part of the, you know, the preface for my book, you know, my, my target audience when I wrote this book was actually young women to uh, seek to empower young women, but it has that has a broader message, which is resonating that you can, you can do what you set, you know, set your mind to that you can recreate yourself. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So So yeah, go ahead. So we were talking earlier about, you know, feeling that need to recreate ourselves on a almost on a periodic basis. I, I think it's, it was drilled into me with 28 years of service and about every two to three years, I needed a new tour. So right. I left the, uh, the Center for STEM Education for Girls and was invited by Vanderbilt to come and teach leadership to undergrads. And oh my gosh, I just, I love teaching, teaching undergraduates. It came as a, it came as a surprise to me. I thought, oh heck, I'll try it. Yeah. And I actually, I just, I just got out of class just a little over an hour ago. So I have a, I have a new crew of students and they are amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Barb, in your book, you, you said that you had some key quotes highlighted. Do you want to mm-hmm. talk about some of those key messages in your books or book uh, or key absolutely. quotes? Absolutely. I, I have some of them tabbed and, you know, I, I guess the first one as, as women, we can support each other and share our stories and the tools we have developed to navigate new frontiers. You know, you and I were certainly pioneers at the Naval Academy and, you know, ultimately, 
you know, we helped to change, change the Navy and change naval history. So other women can do that. You can pioneer in a, a multitude of ways. So, you know, that's, that's, you know, one thing I think of. One of my other quotes is, no is a complete sentence. I know, I love that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting great feedback on that one because, you know, as a, my book is broken up into three different sections and the first part is gritting it out and then navigating turbulence, and then earning your wings. So, you know, after, after all these years at the, you know, at the Naval Academy and all that we went through had built that great foundation of, you know, of, of grit and persistence. But then as I went on to, they went on to flight school, I had to, I had to protect my boundaries. You yeah. know, people were going to test my boundaries. And so that no is a complete sentence. When I, I always, I, I usually tell the story when I out on the speaking circuit that I got to flight school here, I had gone through four years of all that challenge at the Naval Academy, got to flight school. My class date was delayed. I was assigned a job because a single Marine captain saw me and he wanted me to come work for him. So I showed up at his office and the first thing he asked me was whether I could type. And I thought, my gosh, I've gone through four years of that at the Naval Academy and you're asking me whether I can type. Okay, this is, you know, this is the 1980s. You're going to right. be asked something else. But what mm -hmm. he was doing is he was testing my boundaries. And I said, you know, sir, the reason I joined the Navy is to fly. If I had to type for a living, I'd starve to death, sir. So I, you know, start with sir and with sir, he can say almost anything in between. <laughs> in between. But it's like he was, you know, he was seeing where my boundaries were. And then he proceeded to say, hey, well, the next thing he asked me or told me that I had to, I had to make coffee every day. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm thinking all that I have gone through at the Naval Academy and what I learned at the Naval Academy is what is in my head does not immediately come out my mouth. Yeah. So I transitioned that into, you know, sir, I don't drink coffee and I don't make coffee. Again, it was, here's my boundary. And I, I tell young women today, it's not a matter of if it's going to happen to you, it's only a matter of when. Yeah. I'm sure you have a similar story or similar stories. Many, many, many yeah. similar stories. And yeah. you wrote in your book, too, about being the only woman in the room a lot of the times in meetings yes. and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happened to me, too. So put it, to put it in perspective, Barb was a class of 1983. Women were first first graduated, the first class graduated in 1980. So you were in the fourth class of women mm -hmm. to graduate. And I was in the sixth class graduated in 1985. So <clears throat> there were not met very many. I mean, how many women graduated in your class? I think there was like 72 in mine out of like 1200. Well, we started with 90 women and 53 graduated. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you want to know 53 examples of grit and persistence looks like I can I can show you a a photo of my female classmates. Yeah. yeah. Women were only 6% of the student body when I was there. And it was very similar, you know, s same, you know, same for you. Mm -hmm. And so we were, you know, we always stuck out. Right. We always did. We did. <laughs> I remember walking to class and the tourists would be like, there's one, there's one. There's one, yeah. you know, there, there's a female. And then I remember going to a guy's I, that I was, you know, had a date with that night. He was a midshipman and went to his sponsor's house. You know, the, the mids, we usually had a, a family out in town that would sponsor us. So we had a house to go to on the weekend and stuff. And she came down, she saw me and she said, you're a midshipman, but you're pretty. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you experience things people. like that too. You know, it's so funny. I, <laughs> right, you know, right in front of me is my favorite, it's my favorite print. I bought it when I graduated from the Naval Academy and it's a woman midshipman and she's walking downtown Annapolis and she's going past Reardon's. It's no longer there. It's something else. And there are four, you know, there are four waiters and they're all looking at her and I know exactly what they're saying. They're saying, there goes a girl one. Uh-huh. And so, yes, we were those girl ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So Brad wants to know, how are you engaging with girls to engage them with STEM as women are certainly underrepresented in those areas? Oh, you know, I have been, I've been doing this for years. Probably one of the most important things that I do specifically is to be a role model. 
like I said, I've been out, I've been speaking for over, over 30 years. I just joined a group, Astra Femina, lots of women astronauts, and we are, you know, we are working together to get out to different organizations, K through 12, and whether that's virtually or whether that's in person, we've received some great funding recently to, to fund our trips. So I'm doing that as the director of the Center for STEM Education for Girls. I, you know, I've written about girls and women in STEM. Like you got to be able to see it to believe it. Mm -hmm. But there are other things too. It's like recognizing that, you know, girls want to do something with a higher purpose. And so we have to attach STEM to that higher purpose. Yeah, you know, that No makes longer sense. is that story. Are you good in math and science? Hey, then you could be an engineer. Do you want to solve the problems of the world? Then go into STEM. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. They want it tied to a higher purpose. Inquiry-based and project-based learning is incredibly important for girls. There's also another aspect that is, that is not as well known that uh, there's a gap between girls and boys in terms of 3D spatial skills. Oh. And we can, we can fill that gap. <clears throat> so there's some extensive research done by Dr. Cheryl Sorby and she's created a curricula to help girls close that gap. But what I tell parents is that, you know, get your girls out into the garage, you know, give them, you know, give them Legos and build to build to a, a pattern, not just build things with Legos, learn how to rotate and translate and see things in that, in those three dimensions. So yeah. that's another, you know, key piece and, exp you know, exposure to role models. For sure. Is yeah. very critical. Mm -hmm. Right. Hi, Greg. Greg Olson says, these quotes Hi, should Greg. be interesting. Barb is great at USNA. <laughs> I hope you read the book, Greg. <laughs> I think he has. I think he's already written to me. He has read the book. And Brad says, even as an LCPO, I never understood why females in the Navy were treated poorly. All I saw was a good officer and leader in front of me when I was when I was doing one brief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I kind of remember, let's see, and somebody is saying, Joe Kay says, thinking about times of difficulty, what did you learn? early that has helped you along the way? That's a good question, Joe. Hi, Joe. Nice to, nice to have you online. So yeah, so answering, you know, answering that question, I, you know, I go back to the foundations of my time at the Naval Academy. They say, well, you know, while the law said we could be there, much of our experience was telling us differently. And so it was just, you know, learning to rely on one another. I had two fantastic roommates. So that really taught me the importance of, of having those come alongside you and particularly mm -hmm. other women. Mm -hmm. That was, that was really, really critical to me. What I learned too is what it is to live life in the minority. And so that has actually given me a heart to serve others who are in the minority, whether that's chosen or unchosen. So in these you know, current times of difficulty, I look back and say, okay, I've been through, I've been through challenging times before I've done that. I can do what's right in front of me. Looking back and saying, I have that foundation. Yeah. So when was it that you decided you wanted to go to the Naval Academy? Oh my gosh. So my, my parents, they told all, all three children that we were going to college and we need to figure out how to get there. And so I don't know if they did that at night and whispered into our ears while we're asleep, you know, that subliminal messaging, but mm -hmm. we knew that we were going to college. There wasn't a question, mm -hmm. but finding our way to get there. My older brother, he went off to the Air Force Academy, his high school football coach encouraged him to take a look at, at Air Force. So he went off to the Air Force Academy. And when I went out to visit him for parents weekend, I'm, I'm two years younger than Dan. And I saw all the opportunity that he had. I wasn't going to settle for anything less. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at the Naval Academy because I didn't want to be his little sister. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, had a, I'd had enough of that. Yeah. So that's what inspired me to, to apply to the Naval Academy. You know, while I knew intellectually that women were in the minority, you know, our experience was, you know, living that experience was, was far different. But it gave me that elite education that my family couldn't afford that I wanted so desperately. So it started with that desire for education and then, you know, transitioned into really that desire to serve and become a naval officer. 
Yeah. And it opened the entire world to me. I'm from a small town and I've traveled the world. It's been, you know, it's been really remarkable. Yeah. And then you, did you have a, another sibling that went to a military academy too? I did. So we all, we all follow. Dan started and then I went to Navy and then my younger brother, Jim, decided to go to the Air Force Academy. So my parents paid nothing for us to go to college. And then, my, <laughs> then what's remarkable is my older brother, he completed the trifecta. So he has, he has three sons. His oldest and youngest went to Air Force and the, the smart one, Michael went to the Naval Academy. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You know, I just gave my parents a, they had a 60 year wedding anniversary and I gave them a book where you, you know, it was Shutterfly where you put all the pictures in and, mm -hmm. and there was a picture that I had of us visiting the Naval Academy back before women were able to go there. And oh, wow. yeah, so my dad's standing on the seawall with me and my brother and my sister. And then I put that I, next to that, I put a picture of me at graduation day with my brother in his Air Force Academy uniform and my sister who just finished her first year at the Naval Academy both saluting me. So I said on that page, I said, who knew that when we visited the Academy that all three of us would end up going. Now my oh. brother didn't stay. He left after two years. I think he had, I think what, what he had a life changing experience, which I think made him like, ah, I want to, you know, so he well, left, he yeah. had a, like his yeah. appendix almost exploded. And then when he was in the recovery room, he had like a muscle spasm in his larynx and he, and he was choking. And I think that just had him like relook at his life and figure out what he wanted to do. So he left and ended up going to USC, but yeah, all three of us were in. Oh, um, I didn't know that about you. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And then Sylvia says, when we were talking about being a, a woman, a minority, she's saying it's a lot worse as a double, double minority. minority. I, I concur. Mm -hmm. I concur. And yep. so, you know, part of the work that I'm doing right now is to, you know, to help young women and young women of color to learn how to, to press forward in the world, how to really find your voice. What you suggestions know, I, do you have for that? Oh, one of my, my first suggestions is take up a lot of space. How do you do that? I was working with a young woman last semester and I said, you know, take up two chairs, like spread out, make your, like, there's subtle ways that you can make your presence known. And well, one of those simple ones is take up some space. Well, when I was at the Pentagon, you know, and, and even at Nav Air, I think you saw this too, where, you know, the, 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 there's a meeting at the table, but the women, a lot of times tend to go and sit in the chairs in the, around the edge of the room oh, and not I'm, at the table. Unbelievable. Go I, sit at the table. Go sit at the table. If there is a spare chair at the table, take it. Mm -hmm. I was consulting, you know, in the aerospace sector and there was a v, VP and then a director and they were complaining, both women, and they were complaining about not, you know, not being fully, you know, fully part of, you know, the executive team. I thought, I got to sit at the table. You right. have to sit at the table. I was a consultant and I was sitting at the table and they were sitting behind me. Take mm -hmm. your seat at the table. Yeah. And then spread out. My friend, my friend, she, she tends to take up two seats and she's, she's in a different sector. She is a, you know, she's an architect and she works on the, you know, on the commercial side of things, big, huge projects. Uh huh. And yeah, hell yeah. Sit in front and show up big. Right. I agree. <laughs> and so when she's going to, you know, a meeting that's, you know, that's all men or predominantly men, she takes her, you know, she takes her best heels with her and that elevates her by, you know, three or four inches. <laughs> and she, and yeah, and she always takes up space at the table. I, I talk about Anna in my book. Uh huh. Take up some space. Yeah. Show up big. Yep. And, you know, it doesn't have to be waving your hands, but sometimes internally, if you just say, I'm going to show up and I'm going to show up big, I'm going to take up space. You know, that could be energetically. It makes a difference. Yeah. Your energy yeah. shows that I'm here. Yeah. I'm confident. I have something to say. I can contribute to this conversation and I'm going mm -hmm. to speak up. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. 
So mm-hmm. Brad says leaders lead from the front, something I, I imparted to my daughters so they don't shrink away. Yeah. And it's important for men to share this with their daughters, right? Absolutely. Okay. Brad, you got to buy my book and give it to your daughters. I also agree that leaders can lead from behind. So there's leading from the front and there's also leading from behind. But as you're you know, early on in your career, that take up space you know, you belong and you belong at the, t- you belong at the front table. Mm-hmm. Yep. So. so you go around on the speaking circuit and speak about your book. What are some of the stories that you like to tell from your book or from oh. your career? Oh my goodness. Uh, so I, I talk about going, you know, going off to the Naval Academy and thinking that I, I knew what I was getting myself into. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, that's kind of funny. I, I think of, you know, those times of adversity. You weren't there at school at this time, but my plebe year, so my freshman year is when James Webb published his article oh. in the Washingtonian magazine called Women Can't Fight. And it was very um, critical of women at the service academy. Mm-hmm. And then on the heels of that, the chief of naval operations came to speak at, at school. And I don't remember what he said during the lecture, but I'll tell you, I do remember, and I remember for the rest of my life when he said afterwards, a very brave woman, Kathy Bustle, I think she had graduated. She might've, no, she was there when, when you were there. She was class of 82. And she asked the question, she said, you know, sir, you know, many women are going to be getting desk jobs as they graduate from the academy. That's how my roommate remembers. And what I remember is that she said, you know, sir, you've allowed women at the Naval Academy. Why are you not opening up the jobs? And he turned it around on her and he said, so are you telling, I I think you're telling me that women don't belong here. And about 4,000 men, I can't say it was every man, stood up and gave him a standing ovation. I mean, that's the kind of environment that we were in. Yeah. That's the kind of environment that we were in. You know, today in education, we talk about microaggressions, you know, the, the, the smaller, more subtle slights that that women and you know students of color receive we we face a lot of macroaggressions and so you could say in some ways we've made we've made progress and in other ways we still we still have quite a ways to go absolutely but wow i can see why that moment stood out for sure yeah those definitely did mm-hmm. i remember after plebe summer the senior, the firsty, the senior women came and told us just to be aware that the relationship with our classmates was probably going to change after plebe summer, because plebe summer, we had been together with our, you know, the, our classmates and our company, we developed very close relationships, you had to know everyone's first and last name, their hometown and know so much about them, right. And, And you go through all these tough times with them. So you're really close to them, and you've really bonded. And they were saying that, be aware that when the brigade, when all of the other midshipmen come back, the, the kind of peer pressure is going to change and, 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 and your male classmates may not treat you the way you, you would expect. And mm-hmm. we didn't, we thought that's crazy. That's not going to happen, but it did. And I'm not saying it happened with every, you know, male classmate or at all, but it did happen. And mm-hmm. It was challenging. What helped me get through was sports. I played basketball. What about you? Having that close sports team helped me. Absolutely. Having that sports team. So I ran cross country and track and we had two fabulous Marine coaches, uh, Major Mike Sheedy and Major Dunham. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mike Sheedy, he was always so incredibly positive like, hey, let's go do it. I mean, he made you want to run up the hill, you know, <laughs> and then Major Dunham, he was more the drill sergeant. But we had, you know, we had the women's weight room and we could get away from, you know, get away from all that was going on, you know, in Bancroft Hall and be together. And then a, the advantage of being a runner is that we we ran outside the gate. Oh, we nice. Could, we could literally get outside. You could escape. <laughs> so we escaped. So I know a lot of running paths, you know, outside the, the gates of the Naval Academy. Yeah. So it, it really develops close bonds. Like my two roommates that I had throughout the Academy, we went to Mexico for our 40th birthday. And for our 50th, we went to Costa Rica and we're, it's our 60th next year. We're going to go to Hawaii for a couple of weeks together. So wow. we're still really close. 
So it's really well, nice. I, I dedicated my book to Millie and Karen. Mm -hmm. They were my roommates for four years. Yeah. We are, I don't have a sister, but we are tighter than sisters. That's awesome. They are, yeah. They are amazing women in their own right. Yeah. yeah. So what made you want to be a pilot? So I was a naval flight officer. Mm -hmm. I didn't have 2020 vision, but I could still fly in a, you know, in a different way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can even go back to my brother going off to the Air Force Academy. He didn't have the vision to be a pilot. So my parents told him that he, they could take, he could take flying lessons and they would pay for that. So my first class year, my senior year, I called them up and I said, hey, I just signed up for flying lessons, so I'm sure you're going to pay for that. <laughs> they said, what? I, well, it was, it was open to him. Obviously, it was open to me. So that, you know, that spurred my interest. I wanted to do, I wanted to keep pioneering. Yeah. And so flying, flying was a way to do that. So I decided, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And then I had also met a Lieutenant, at that time, Lieutenant Colleen Nevius. She was the first Navy woman to graduate from Navy test pilot school. I met her when I was a, when I was a first classman. I was like, oh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not only going to fly, but after that, I'm going to go to test pilot school. You really set some big goals for yourself. I did. I mean, looking back, you know, it, it didn't seem like it at the time. You know, it was just like, oh, my gosh, test pilot school. I could combine flying with my engineering background, like, oh my gosh, that is incredible. <laughs> and it, you know, and it was, it was absolutely incredible, you know, to, to apply to and get accepted to Navy test pilot school. Yeah. So, the, and then, oh, what was I going to say? It just slipped my mind. I'm getting a little older. Oh, you were a program manager. So that's a big deal too, being a program manager at the Naval Air Systems Command in charge of an acquisition program. There's not a lot of female Navy captains that, that do that. <laughs> no, I have, I, I have this theme of being the only or one of the only. Yeah. And usually it's, it leans more towards the only. So I was the, I was the only woman in my flight school class. I was the only woman in my test pilot school class. You know, my first command, they had never had a woman in that role. My second command was as a Navy program manager. You know, I was, I was the first, you know, woman aviator across the Navy to go to become a, a major program manager. So by that time I was, I was so used to it. Yeah. And I will say, I'm going to give you the bottom line of my book. I knew I was never going to fit in. So I chose to stand out. Mm. And honestly, the program that I took over was struggling. And I immediately brought visibility to that, to that program office by being who I was. And that allowed us, you know, that helped get the right resources and people and team members to turn, to turn things around. So what do you mean by being who you were, by being a female or by being Barb, who is not going to hide that the program's struggling and is going to go find the resources by being you? Yes. And yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. You know, we, we learned back at the Naval Academy, we were always going to be watched. Mm -hmm. I remember getting to flight school and I tell the story in my book. I, I, I was going to, I was speeding on base and I got pulled over. <laughs> and I, with that, I was given a ticket and an invitation to meet the commanding officer of the base. <laughs> so I remember, you know, showing up at his office. I, I had my uniform on, you know, nothing out of place. My hair was pulled back perfectly. And I met with him and he said to me, you've got to realize you are one of the only women here on, on base. You've got to set the example. Only oh, one of the only female officers and, and enlisted. There's not a and lot enlisted. of enlisted even on that base. Right, right. And so I realized that I was going to be a role model, whether I liked it or not. And that was uh, that was a, a defining point. I mean, how, how funny is that? You, you got caught speeding, you go to the all of a sudden it's like, OK, I I am here not just for myself. I am here for all the women who will follow me. And how did you handle that pressure? Or did you look at it as pressure? I, I didn't look at it as pressure. I mean, we've been through the pressure cooker of four years at the Naval Academy. It was like, okay, got it. I got it. This is what I'm going to do. 
I mean, and there were some ups and downs along the way. No, you know, no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. But it, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm setting the example. Mm-hmm. So Joe K asks, what's been the most curious or unexpected reaction to your book so far? <laughs> Joe and I have lunch every, or we have breakfast every Friday morning. And so she always asks, so she always asks great questions. She's my great British friend. Most curious, unexpected reaction to my book. The, the fact that people are taking action based on my book. I was on a, I was on a virtual, a virtual web, you know, on a, a web, on a webinar. And uh, afterwards, this, this gentleman wrote to me, he said, I'll have to tell you how much I appreciated your story. And he said, I've done something I've never done before. He said, I immediately ordered your book. I read it cover to cover. And now I'm, now I'm ordering nine more for every woman in my life. Hmm. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to write it, you know, to these young women, I'm going to give it to every granddaughter and uh, grandniece when they turn 16. I thought, wow, that's, that's remarkable. It's really, really remarkable. Is. Yeah. So that's, that's the unexpected reaction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, one of the best parts about, you know, about my book and going to book signings is that I am reconnecting with people and I'm connecting with new people. And that's been really beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's been really lovely. So this a show is, you know, it started out as like being overcoming adversity and moving forward, which we've both done that, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and, uh, and then it was like the Onward podcast, facing adversity, moving forward and discovering ourselves along the way, because I think you learn a lot about yourself when you go through uh, tough times. And now the theme is uh, create a life you love living now. And what I mean by that is like, don't wait, don't say, well, once this happens, or if I had a better boss, or if I had a different job, or once I retire, what can you do today to really love your life? So what advice do you have for the listeners about how they can, you know, create a life that they love living now? And how have you done that for yourself? I think taking that, you know, a a fierce internal or inventory of yourself, I think it's, it starts with that. Okay. What is it that I don't like about my current job? What is it that I don't like about my current life? It's too busy. It's too this, it's too that. I often think of when I use the term, I'm so, I'm too busy. I have switched that to, I live a very full life. Words matter, Uh, right? They have energy. Yeah. Words matter. Absolutely. I knew that, uh, you know, when I retired from the Navy, I really didn't want to work full time again. Mm-hmm. So I tried consulting and the, so you start dabbling, tried consulting, eh, not so much. Okay. So I'm just going to go to school. So you just have to take that next step. So I went to school, did something totally different. I remember as I was studying theology, the very first day of class, <laughs> this professor asked me, she goes, well, how do you feel about being here? And I just about fell out of my chair. I thought, gosh, no one has ever asked me that in an academic environment. Like, how do you feel? (laughs) Like, how do you feel? How do you feel about it? You know, so yeah, taking a look, okay, what's, you know, what's not working? What I have learned is like, when I start feeling things bubble up from inside myself, I've learned to look at it instead of repressing like, oh, just forget about that. Just push that down. You know, look at it because, you know, your, your soul is trying to tell you something. Yeah. Did you learn that when you were in the Navy or after you got out? You know, part started to transition as I was getting out of the Navy, you know, I could, I could feel that tap on my shoulder, like, okay, it's time yeah. need to pass the torch. You know, I thought, well, I could stay in. I, I know I could, I know I could make flag. I could become an admiral, but I had this, I just had this vision that it'd be great to put that star on. And then the next morning I'd wake up and say, why did you do that? So not working full time, finding new avenues. I have two children, you know, after I had, I had one son, I had my son, you know, while I was still in the Navy, I knew that, you know, getting out would allow me to adopt my daughter, Mm -hmm. you know, and I look at her every day and it's like, you know, that's, she's the reason, or she's one of, she's one of the very important reasons as to why I chose not to work full time. You know, and it's funny, you and I talked about this, I don't know how many years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And then yeah, then that like, okay, I need to do something bigger, you know, develop the next generation of leaders. I'm an adjunct right now. And I love that. I teach two classes 
and I don't have any other responsibilities. So I can really focus on my students. That's awesome. And help to develop them. So it's like two classes of coaching up to 30 students at a time. It's fantastic. Yeah, you know, wow. it gets busier. Like when, okay, when it's, when it's, when it's getting busy, that's that message. Like, okay, is this full or is this busy? Right. Right. So what, what, so that's part of what you love in your life. What else, you know, do you love about your life that you've created? I used to think that I wanted to always work, you know, in a team or, in, you know, in a building, in an office. And I think COVID has helped with that, you know, working at home, flexing between the two. I like the idea of a hybrid environment where I get the opportunity to work at home. And then I, I go to Vanderbilt and I teach in person, mm -hmm. that flexing back and forth. You know, I've allowed space for a new man in my life and, you know, he awesome. showed up, which mm -hmm. is really great. And having accountability partners, Joe, who's online, we meet, every, we meet every week. She remembers when you know, we met as we both moved to Nashville at the same time mm -hmm. and became really good friends. She was there when we would write together and, she was there when I f only had an outline. And so oh, nice. we keep each other, I'd say we keep each other balanced. And I have, I still, I have Millie and I have Karen. I have a couple of great male friends that are, that are checking in on me and kind of, you know, seeing, you know, seeing if I'm not staying on track, but leaning more towards that full life instead of a busy life. Yeah, that's important. I, I have a couple of accountability partners and I think they're very helpful. And especially when you're at home working by yourself, not in a team environment as much, you know, it's just kind of helpful to have some people that you can bounce ideas off of or share, you know, some challenges that you're having that can kind of help make sure that, you know, help keep us in check, right? Because, right. yeah, I think we all need that. We, we all need that. Yes. Yeah. You know, I mean, what caused you to... I put on that star, I guess you'd say, because I became a senior executive, which is the equivalent of, of Admiral, and I and I just was so busy, and I didn't want to be busy anymore, and I knew it was my job keeping me busy, and so I retired, and I was busier than ever, so uh, I didn't have a job that's... to point to anymore. I'm like, well, what the heck's going on? It's uh, not the job. It's not my boss. It's It's me. It's me. Yes. And that's why I like to talk about create a life you love living now. It's like, don't wait for retirement, you know, because that's what I was doing. Well, when I retire, I knew I was going to be in great shape because I didn't have all this free time, but I didn't. I was like so used to being chained to a desk, you know, per se, that I was at right. the desk and I was working. I was becoming a coach. I was starting my podcast. I was doing all this stuff. And then, you know, and then my former husband passing away within five months after I retired helped too, because, you know, he worked at Nav Air. He was a GS-15. He worked and worked and worked. And I saw him die with regrets, like, of how he lived his life. And that made me think, how do I want to live my life from here on out? So I started to really, you know, we plan our work life, you know, work. We plan, you know, where we're going to go and at work, what our objectives are for the year for work we're we're I didn't really ever sit down and like really like think well what do I want in my life it had always been the kids and work right but then what about me you know that's where a great coach comes into play yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah I was I was working with a a coach when I was going to Merrillhurst University I call him yeah he was my three-in-one man he was a he was a he was a coach. He was a spiritual director and, and a therapist all in one, like my trifecta. And so I'd walk into his office and I'd say, okay, I don't know who I need today, but this is it. And then I remember uh, one day walking into his office and I said, no settling. I said, I don't know what that means, but I want you to hold me to that. Mm -hmm. And I walked out of his office having said I was going to pursue a doctorate in leadership and higher education at a major university. And the next year I was in Vanderbilt. You know, then yeah. as I was coming out of Vanderbilt and I was, uh, I could feel like that inflection point. Okay, this, you know, this, this is going to change. So I got another coach and I drew these three circles and I would invite, I invite everyone to think about that. So one circle was my family life. 
Another one was my professional life and then my personal life, you know, who am I as a woman? And mm -hmm. I wanted to see a lot of intersection. I love Venn diagrams. I'm a, you know, it's like, oh, you're an engineer. I'm an engineer. <laughs> so where, where was that overlap? And what did, what did I want it to, what did I want it to look like? Yep. So. And be intentional about that and then revisit it every so often. And that's why I told you before the show, you know, you'd ask, well, why did I decide to end the podcast? And I, I had gone on a camping trip. I like to get away like that in nature. And I thought, all right, what do I want to create in my life now? What, what's calling me? And, you know, I, I wanted to end this podcast before I got really tired of doing it. I've done over 200 mm -hmm. episodes, like 230 or something like that. And I'm just, you know, I feel ready to create it. It probably takes like six hours a week out of my out of my week. And I and I just want more time for myself. It's been a gradual slowing down for me. You know, I said when I retired that I was busier than ever. And it's not like I stopped right away. I've been working with coaches. I've been working on myself. I became a coach. And now I help people, you know, my clients do the same thing that you know, I've been going mm -hmm. through. But it's looking at your life and figuring out, okay, well, wait a second, take a little pause. What do I want to create? What do I want to let go of? What's not serving me anymore in all aspects of our life and making sure that we have that balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, definitely. I've had the benefit of working with a lot of coaches and, and now I get to coach people and I, I just love it. That's something I love to do. And so another reason for in the podcast, six more hours, I could spend some of that time on me and I can spend some of that time with Coaching. more clients too, mm -hmm. helping more people. Because so. they're 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 different than just an accountability partner. Yeah, yeah. And really, coaches are. Yeah. So you know, so many of these answers come from deep within ourselves. The yeah. answer's already there, and we just have to, you know, we have to tease it out on our own. And getting, you know, having someone else help us tease it out, you'll be surprised with what emerges. For sure. Absolutely. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. And your coach should also have a coach. Coaches need coaches too. Coaches Everybody, need coach. coaches are uh, <laughs> beneficial. Yeah. So yeah. what did you like best about flying? Oh my gosh. Oh, before I say, I see Greg Olson. He said she had to deal with a lot of folks like me. Greg, <laughs> you were one of those good guys. So I, I appreciate He is it. a good guy. Um, you know, having you as a friend back many years ago. So I wanted to address that. So, <laughs> uh, so flying. You know, flying was, gave me the opportunity to live in, in, in three dimensions, you know, to see things from up above. And I was just talking with Greg, the, the wonderful man whom I'm in a relationship with. And we, we've been, he was an aviator as well. That sense of up, up, and you see the world differently. You see that maybe you're not as important as you thought you were. You get to see the you know the the, the whole the, the contours of the united states you know you could live at you could live at either coast and think we are so overpopulated but if you get the chance to fly across the country and you see that we do things differently in many different areas and sometimes i mean it's miles or hundreds of miles between communities or even you know probably even a thousand so that that sense of of being up has helped me look at life differently okay well if i pull myself back what is that forty thousand foot perspective mm -hmm. so that's what i help people with in my own coaching or in my own teaching mm -hmm. i have that broader pers i have that broader perspective and i also know what it means to come down low i mean get down and you know get down on the weeds or you know go fast on a low level i know what that feels like so having had that, that opportunity, you know, changed my, like my worldview. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I love that about flying, you know, in, in Tennessee, we often have these beautiful skies with some wonderful clouds. And that's when I miss flying. Yeah, I was going to ask if you miss it. I'm sure you do. That's when I miss it. But then, you know, then you see some of the thunderstorms build and thinking, <laughs> You know, I remember that time we were hit by lightning five times and that was pretty unpleasant. And, you know, we came back and landed and I, I got out and kissed the ground and <laughs> said, I could have a, I could have a desk job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, or you know, flying up and flying up in Alaska, we were headed to, we we're headed to Anchorage and all of a sudden the weather started rolling in and we realized we couldn't land there. So our alternate was Fairbanks 
another weather system had rolled in there. So Whoa. we're like, oh, okay, we're going to have to land at a little civilian field and convince them to fuel us while because we couldn't shut what if we, we couldn't shut down our jet because we didn't have a jet starting unit at these civilian fields so we actually ended up going all the way out to the beginning of the Aleutian chain there was there was an air force alert strip there so, wow I and mean, that was that was pretty sweet. that was that must have been terrifying were you like close to running out of fuel or yeah we were i mean we were on final and they said they gave us a, a directions to turn in holding because there was a 747 stuck on the end of the runway because these weather systems were covering both Fairbanks and Anchorage. So wow. Greg says, and the resources are different in coastal cities versus <laughs> the working heartline <laughs> or Alaska. Yeah. So some of it, you know, like, okay, you know, they gave us, they said, well, you're going to have to go into holding. Like, we don't have the gas. We're landing. Well, there's a 747 on the end of the runway. Well, we're landing. That's fine. Wow. So sometimes you just have to put it down, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you have to say, no, we are yeah. landing. <laughs> no, no. No is no a is complete a sentence. sentence. No, we are landing. Yes, we are landing. Yeah. That's what we're doing. <laughs> So you got one, one little clip in here. It says, don't clip your own wings. What do you mean by that in your book? Oh, I'm looking at it. You have a, a As, chapter on don't oh, clip yes. your own wings. Don't clip your own wings. You know, I tell people that you have a hundred percent chance of not getting, whether that is grad school, whether that is that next job, if you don't apply. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes women think they have to have all of the qualifications for a particular job where men will say, oh, I got 30 or 40 percent. Oh, I couldn't possibly do that. Uh, no, put your name in for it. If it scares you a little bit, hey, that's probably a good indication that that's something that you should do. Yeah. So don't say, oh, I couldn't possibly. You know, Cheryl Sandberg, she talks about she talked about that in Lean In. Yeah. You know, where, you know, where women will say, well, I don't know, but I want to have a family and I want to do this. And I'm like, well, are, are you married now? Well, no, I'm not even married. I'm like, oh, just, I just go for it. And don't say I couldn't possibly, because, you know, you and I are, you know, living proof of, hey, hey you know, anyone can do it. <laughs> you know, I mean, just find your path for, for whatever that is. For us, that was, that was the Naval Academy, mm -hmm. you know, just yep. go do it. And some of those resources will come. Yeah. <laughs> Greg says NATOPS. Explain what NATOPS is. NATOPS oh. does not replace good judgment. Oh, that's Naval Aviation. I forget the rest of the acronym, but it's the big manual that talks of, you know, that references how you fly your airplane. Yeah. You know, this is, this is how you do it. We'd say it's written in blood because a lot of mistakes have been made that have cost lives. This is how you do it. Yeah. But having, yeah, having good judgment. <laughs> that That's really like, we're putting it down now. Yeah. We are, we're <laughs> you're you're going to run out of fuel. You're going to land. <laughs> yeah. We're landing. That's what we're doing. Yeah. So if people want to reach out to you, like what, what kinds of services do you offer? Like you would come to a school, maybe talk about your book or, or what kinds of things could well, people do, reach out um, to you for? You know, I do, I speak about my book. I, you know, uh, I'm a keynote speaker. I provide workshops. I, I, you know, I will come and speak to a school, you know, absolutely. But I've been leaning more into, into speaking, you know, and as we're coming out of, coming out of COVID, there's more demand for that. So mm -hmm. that's where I get the, the majority of my juice is by speaking to live audiences. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, so. I do that. So you can reach out to me. Yep. As it says in the chat, Barbara at captainbarbarabell.com. You can sign up for my newsletter on my website. Okay. I'd love to include anyone in that. Here's her and, website. Yeah. Which is captainbarbarabell.com. And I'll put all this in the show notes too, for people listening. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, yeah. That would be great. And then you're on Twitter. Are you on there actively? I'm, I'm working on getting more active on Twitter. We spoke about this a little bit earlier. <laughs> I'm focusing on, on LinkedIn right now, uh -huh. uh, you know, with uh, business audiences, you know, that's really where it is for me on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. That's where I get most of my, you know, my best feedback is actually on LinkedIn. Got it. So I'm working on that. Southern Marin is having a STEM festival. Okay. I guess, Greg, you'll just have to find a way to invite me to that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. A STEM festival in Southern Maryland. Yep. Okay. And then let's see, you've got Instagram. 
I have Instagram too. Captain Barbara That's Bell. Me. And then That's your me. website, captainbarberbell.com. And then buy her book. You can get that on the website, right? Flight Lessons can, Navigating yes, Through it, Life's it, Turbulence it, and Learning to Fly to High. Fly high. Absolutely. So my bottom line in my book, as I said before, is if, if you don't fit in, choose to stand out. And it's a choice. There you go. There's her book. There we go. <laughs> well, thank you for being Great. an awesome guest, Barb. I, pre I enjoyed our conversation tonight. Oh, I did, I did too, Emily. It's uh, it's delightful. You know, I think back a number of years ago, we were talking exactly about how do you create this life that you love. And you had said, when you publish your book, you can be on my podcast. So yep. here I am. Here you are. <laughs> this is great. Thank you yeah. so very much. And thank you for everyone, you know, who listened online, lovely comments. And, you know, thanks for being my friends. Yes. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who watched. I really appreciate you. There's not a show next week. The next one's coming up. I think it's the 28th, the following Wednesday after next. And the last show is going to be on November 2nd. So I hope you join me for that. I think I'll be the only guest there just kind of talking about what I've learned and doing over 200 podcast interviews and just talking about life, answering any questions that people might have. And you know, I don't know if it's going to be a, a break forever, if it's just going to be a break for the winter time. We'll just see. I'll just see how if I miss it or how I'm feeling or what else I'm moving into my life after letting this go. But I've really enjoyed doing the show. And I appreciate everyone who watched tonight and everybody who listens to the show at, when I publish it as a podcast. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Onward Live is sponsored by Emily Harmon Coaching and Consulting. Visit my website, emilyharmon.com, to learn more about me and my coaching programs. I'd love to help you create a life you love living. Remember, every adversity is our own personal university. Sometimes the lessons are difficult, and we must learn from our experiences. Vulnerability is your superpower. You are lovable and worthy. And we discuss these topics and more because professional is personal. Thank you for joining us and engaging with me and my guests.